Yeah, here it is. Does Adventism echo Roman Catholic theology? My friends Bob and Des tell me, at least they told me long ago, and I haven't heard either one of them for a long time, but they told me and they told us that conservative Adventism especially is Roman Catholic. I'm willing to concede that our experience has generally been legalistic, but I'm not willing to acknowledge that our theology is Roman Catholic. It never has been, it never will be. They are worlds apart, and I'm prepared to share with you the evidence for it tonight. And I would like to say this does not take us off the hook we've been on for 125 years, and more before that. We still need to understand and have an experience that frees us from the legalism that is inherent in all nature, human nature. And let me tell you something, I will not try to demonstrate it, but I can share with you plenty of evidence that the other side, the liberal side, whatever you want to call it, is also legalist, legalistic. We both are. We all are. By nature, we are legalistic. We will seek to, well, we will seek our independent ways of uh, salvation only as we come to depend fully upon Christ do we have freedom from legalism. But that is something we need to pass by right now. Brinsmead, I first heard it from Brinsmead. It wasn't very long I heard it from Ford. Same thing, same wording. That demands an examination of Trent because their insistence was that we are in harmony with the doctrines of Trent. Now, what is the doctrine of Trent? Well, the Council of Trent met over a period of many years beginning in the year of Martin Luther's death. Their first report came out just before Luther died. What a blessing that Luther didn't have to deal with it. It created terrible confusion because we'll have to see what the purpose and the way in which that council um, prepared its report. The Trent Council of Trent had three purposes. First of all, to reform the abuses of the papacy itself and the clergymen, of the, uh, of the pope even, and, and, and of the officers. And there were gra grave abuses. Everyone knew that. And for centuries people tried to correct, but no one would allow it to be corrected. And it went on and on. Finally, Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the door and Hundreds of thousands of people flocked to Martin Luther, and it came to a point where the Roman Catholic Church had to take action. And so they appointed the Council of Trent to reform Catholicism. Now, the purpose of reforming, let's take a look. What, how did this work? Well, number two, to construct expressions. Well, first of all, to reform the, the gross abuses, which had to do with land ownership and a lot of other things. Then to construct expressions to withstand the hammer blows of scripture by Protestants who violated the church's authority. That is, they were boldly denying the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Number three, their purpose was to preserve at all costs the supreme papal authority with special attention to justification, the cornerstone of Reformation theology. Now, let me say this. To begin with, there were some of those men who really were seeking true Reformation. And that would have included uh, removing the authority of the Pope. Yeah, some of them wanted to do it. They were over, uh, overruled. There was no way. And so the Council of Trent, which began with some earnest, sincere people hoping to, to really reform the church. No, the only thing that could be reformed was the gross abuses and the extreme heresies. 
let's take a look at the next picture. Trent's methodology to intensify Protestant conflict by pitting the free will views as in such a way that, okay, first of all, free will ver versus Calvin Luther, Luther. Now, in another night or two, we'll have to be talking about that because Calvin Luther should not be a hyphen. The, the positions were not the same. But this is the Reformation, I should say, the review of those who claim Reformation theology. And I call that refor reformist theology because it is not true Reformation theology. When Des Ford talks about Reformation theology, he is talking, we're going to find out, we're, he's talking about ultra-Lutheran theology, which came in through, now I've given you the secret. <laughs> Ultra-Lutheranism came in through Plymouth Brethrenism, now into uh, some segments of the Adventist Church. But brothers and sisters, it's, don't, don't think of Luther as being, and even Calvin, the two were different, and they had both problems, but the theory and the views of Desford don't follow either one of them. They follow some elements of both of them, but they were not the same either. And I, I will share with you evidence for that. Now, in reality, what they did was to present a Pelagian free will. It was ultra-Lutherans against Melanchthon. They called themselves Nisio, genuine, meaning genuine, Lutherans. They were no more Nisio Lutherans than I am. Well, they were closer to it in some ways, but certainly they were not Nisio. That was not the genuine Luther. Definitely not. They called themselves Nicio Lutherans, and they went to war against Luther and Melanchthon. Now, Melanchthon and Luther were very close. They were bonded personally and, and, and spiritually and theologically. <clears throat> Melanchthon was the one who was helping Luther with some of his problems. You see, Luther was a mystic. It was difficult for Luther to get away from the mysticism of Roman Catholicism, which comes from paganism. Mysticism is a pagan uh, thing, which channeled through Catholicism and, and then, of course, into Protestantism. And Luther was not able to. Luther was aghast uh, at the blasphemy of the Eucharist, because the Eucharist, they claimed that the priest, by mumbling certain Latin words, transformed the bread into the body of Christ and the, uh, and the, and, and the grape juice into the blood of Christ. Luther said, oh, that's horrible. That's a part of the decretals of, uh, uh, of the, uh, what are the, I can't remember the wording now, but anyway, the, of the dunghill of Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic um, heresies. Luther wouldn't go along with that, but Luther was a mystic, and Luther was certain that the body of Christ was really present because the Bible says, Jesus said, this is my body. He handed them the bread, he said, this is my body. He handed them the cup, and he said, this is my blood, and Luther couldn't get any farther than that. And uh, his co-reformer from Switzerland Tell me what it is. Zwingli. When Zwingli read those same words, he understood that to be a symbol. After all, Christ had his own body right there, hadn't been crucified yet. He was handing them bread. His body was here, the blood flowing through his veins. He was not giving them some mystical concept of unreality. And uh, Zwingli recognized that. But you know what? Luther wouldn't even shake hands with him because he was an agent of the devil because only the devil would deny the literal, physical presence of Christ. And so Luther called it consubstantiation instead of trance. You see, trance means to transfer from one state to another. 
trans substance, substantiation, trans substance, changing substance. It was bread and wine. It now is the body of Christ and his blood. Luther said, no, 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 that's impossible. But Luther did believe when the Bible says, this is my blood, this is my body, and when he, it, it took a long time for his disciples and Zwingli's disciples to bring them together. Zwingli was eager to come together with him, but Luther, no. And finally, they convinced him that they must have a conference, and they did, and all Luther could do in response to uh, Calvin's evidence uh, that this was actually symbolic rather than literal, all he could say is that Jesus said, this is my body. And if Jesus said, this is my body, it was his body. See, that, that's mystical, you see. It, it's mysticism from, borrowed from paganism, transferred through Catholicism, and of course, Luther was a strong mystic, a wonderful man. But let me tell you something. God is well, so merciful when he judges us. Luther was doing the best he could. He didn't have all the light. He did the best. And by the way, his concept of justification wasn't completely mature. And uh, you can see that because uh, he made statements that seemed to contradict each other, and, and there was no way to reconcile them. They did contradict each other. But ultra-Lutherans took his extreme statements and made that the norm. But Luther made many statements that would deny their concept of the norm. Luther was a mystic, but he, for the most part, taught principles of justification that we can accept, but not through Nicios. Nicios declared war on Melanchthon, and they fought him until he died, and when he died, he expre expressed the fact that he was eager to be uh, free from the attacks uh, of, of the Nicio Lutherans. I better look at my thing here and follow it or we'll never finish tonight. Tulip, what does tulip mean? Huh? Uh, I hear voices, but I don't hear any words. Uh, this is the Calvinist position. What does T, T stand for? T stands for uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, and by the way, I, if I get busy with this thing and my files close on me, I'm going to be in real trouble. I may need some of your help. Uh, but uh, this means that, the, uh, that, that, that everything we do is tainted by sin. And that's not the word, but can't say the word. Huh? Total depravity. Yeah, total, total depravity. Thank you. So I couldn't even think of the word total. Uh, so I really am kind of hopeless. <laughs> Total depravity does not mean, he did not mean that everything we did was absolutely evil, but everything we did was tainted with sin. Was he right, Calvin? Yeah, no, no, he was right. But, but we were selfish people, so when we do good things, we're probably selfish and have some selfish motives and so forth, but we don't even know about. You remember what we read about uh, Wagner, his confession after Ellen White reproved him. He said as far as he knew, he, he had nothing but, um, but, the, but the love of God for truth in his heart. Now he could see that there was a lot of pride. So, uh, yeah, there is pride. I can't even guarantee that I'm not expressing pride now. But I'm not worrying about it because my righteousness is in Christ. I'm committed to do his will and to teach the gospel the best I can. And to any degree he needs to talk to me after this session, he will do so. And sometimes he does. And it's not infrequently that he will challenge me about motives I was totally unaware of. And I thank him for it. But he's the only one that can do that. If you tell me that, I can't believe you. <laughs> anyway. To intend, you mean we haven't even gotten through these four? To intensify the conflict. You see, 
when we vary from Scripture and we fail to follow the third principle of the, of, of, of the Reformation, the first was sola scriptura, second sola fide, or sola gratia, sola fide. That means saved by grace alone through faith alone. And by the way, that's true. We can't save ourselves. And then the priesthood of believers. But brothers and sisters, the first two are based on the third. Without a priesthood of believers, we cannot have a true sola scriptura. Because if we do not have a, a priesthood of believers in which we are ready to be corrected as well as to share, you know, somebody will correct others, we can never be sure whether the truth we believe is true or whether it's our, 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 our um, perception of truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, if I'm going to have solo to scripture, it has to be in the context of willingness to listen to anybody who can share with me scripture that will correct me. Otherwise, I will be certain that my view of truth is truth, even if I'm involved in heresy. We must subject ourselves one to another. And it is only in that context that we learn to experience humility. It takes humility to humble ourselves one to another. But humility is something we cannot produce, but we can follow God's principles, and the Holy Spirit can produce the experience of humility in our lives by helping us to know how to relate to each other. Well, uh, now no more sermons on that. Uh, defend free will against Augustinian concerns, extremes, and to make free will appear uh, to be uh, papal or Pelagian. Now, Catholicism is based on two basic principles, Augustinianism and Pelagianism. Who was Augustine and who was Pelagian? Well, there were two men who were opposed to each other way back there in the fourth century and breaking over into the fifth. As a matter of fact, Pelagius arose in, in, in response and reaction against Augustine, whose views were very similar to ultra-Lutherans that we were talking about. Pelagius says that grace, uh, and this is an ultra-Pelagian thing, but grace is good and it's important and it helps us with salvation, but it's not necessary. It is possible through the free will to choose the right. Now, brothers and sisters, Luther knew better than that. And he wrote a book on the bondage of the will. A lot of truth in that. Our wills are in bondage to our own impulses. Satan can manipulate those impulses, but he wouldn't have to. Our own impulses are unworthy enough. Pelagianism will never do. Brothers and sisters, Free will, yes, but how? Through the presence of the Holy Spirit who sets our wills free. When we seek to choose his will, he gives us the ability to do so. And as long as we look to Christ, he will give us the gift of free will. But when we look to ourselves, we enter into bondage again. And that's where we have the struggles. Free will. He the purpose of Trent was to paint free will in terms of its own Pelagianism while denying the Pelagian extremes. I can tell you one thing, brothers and sisters. I'm not going to be able to give you all the material I have here. It's, it's, it's too much. And I guess I was too, uh, um, well, what do, you, what do you call it, too? Uh, ambitious. Too ambitious, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll have to give you a few samples and to give you the principles of it. Brothers and sisters, Trent, the Council of Trent, had a very specific purpose, and that was to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And they did so by focusing on the principles that Melanchthon stood for but perverted principles. Not Melanchthon's perversion, but their own Roman Catholic perversion. 
the Roman Catholic Church has existed. Ellen White says that there are two opposite principles, and I'm using my words right now, I can't think of her wording, uh, two opposite principles that sustain uh, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. That we can be saved without works, or we can be saved by our works. Pelagianism and Augustinianism. <coughs> that has been the history of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why she can take in all kinds of people. Those who go to one extreme, those go to the other, and neither one is out of place there. They hold them both. But now is time to re reforming, and therefore we have to cut off the extreme ends of both sides. And that's what the Council of Trent. Some of the wording of the Council of Trent appears to be more Protestant than Protestants. And that's deliberate. They took in every bit of ground that they possibly could, but don't ever believe that they were thinking Protestant. You can use words for various purposes. Words can be used to communicate or to deceive. Where are we? Where are we at? We finished that. Notice the introduction to Trent. And I, you know, you'll notice a lot of dots, dots, because I'm trying to shrink it in so we can put it in a short space. But I can tell you that I have attempted to make sure that I did not in any wise uh, um, leave out anything that would change the meaning. The true and sound doctrine touching justification, which Jesus, Christ Jesus, taught, his disciples transmitted, and the Catholic Church has always Retained. Well, that enough, that's enough, right? That's enough. The Roman Catholic Church has always retained. Why did Luther come into being? Oh, but this is their claim. And their purpose is to out-Protestant, out you know, out-Luther, out Luther, and, 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 and to, to gather in, um, bring back, and they did a tremendous job. But Council Trent would never have worked if it had not been the divisions within Protestantism that permitted it because they gave the people of Trent all the arguments they needed against each group. They gave them to them. For this group, fighting against this group, Protestants, giving biblical reasons, and maybe on this point they're right. So. They give them plenty of biblical evidence against this group. This group may give some biblical answers, you know, biblical evidence against them. This is how the trend worked. It was simply taking the debates and the divisions of, the, uh, of Protestantism and intensifying them. But above all, their purpose was to attack Calvin I'm using that as a general term, you know, uh, this uh, determinism, etc., to attack that in such a way as to make the Protestants believe that Melanchthon and his followers were Roman Catholic. You remember what we talked about, this pushing business? <laughs> Here's another place for it. You see, if the Roman Catholic Church can formulate some of its precepts and some of this doctrine so that they look like they're the same as Melanchthon's, this then will give Melanchthon's followers the taste of blood. And it makes it possible for them to nail them as Roman Catholic. Melanchthon was not Roman Catholic. Melanchthon was, in my opinion, the closest to the theological accuracy of any of the reformers. Now, he had his own problems, but let me tell you something. He led, he led Luther away from his most extreme positions. He wasn't able to get far with consubstantiation, but he did know how to deal with the truth that, that, uh, uh, that oh my, give me the name again, the Switzerland, Switzerland, Zwingli. Zwingli. He did, he did treat that 
as symbolic. But what did he do? You know, he was a close friend of Luther. He really loved Luther. And he was not just being a politician, but he was seeking to broaden truth. And he was doing a good job of it. But brothers and sisters, he took the same basic position as Zwingli, but he stated it differently. He stated it accurately. But what he did was to emphasize the fact that Christ was truly present. Now, we call it the what service? Communion service. If Christ is not present through the Holy Spirit, do we have the communion that, that is promised? Is the Holy Spirit present in every communion service? If the hearts are open to receive him? Oh, yes, really, truly. If, you see... Melanchthon emphasized that which was true. He did not deny truth, but he did not openly challenge Luther's position of consubstantiation, and Luther understood him, and the two were able to work together. God, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, and it's a great tragedy that that wasn't true with Luther and Zwingli. If the Holy Spirit had been permitted, he would have brought them all into unity. And he would have brought them into unity through humble processes such as Melanchthon demonstrates. But brothers and sisters, the whole, you know, a while ago my brother was very kind. He, he showed me that it was half through, and I know it should be more than that, because we had quite a long period before, and so I'm going to try to beat you this time. <laughs> not beat on you. <laughs> I don't know if I can or not, but I'm going to do my best to get enough of this so that you can get the sense of it without going through. I, oh, I wasn't planning to go through all 33 doctrines. That is, the, three, the decrees, I should say, about justification doctrine. 33 of them. I picked about um, seven of them that I was going to go through. But I, I don't think I will be able to. And so uh, with your permission, I'll just say, make comments about some of them and, and, and tell you. I've already told you about the basic structure, but, but we haven't gotten to the, oh, about the, the very last thing it says most. Oh, look, the clincher, the succeeding, the final clause of the introduction. Here it is. Most strictly forbidding. Oh, now we're taking real authority most strictly forbidding that any henceforth presume to believe, preach, or teach otherwise than is by this present decree defined and declared. And I got the is in the wrong place, but you understand. Brothers and sisters, the Catholic doctrine of justification is not the same. Or Adventist doctrine is no wise the same. We're going to see in just a moment. I'll pick up enough so you'll be able to see <coughs> that uh, something of what I've already shared with you. But first of all, I've put here the consummate subtlety of Roman skill. Tremendously skillful. And they succeeded. Uh, the tremendous reversal of the Reformation. A number of countries have been Roman Catholic ever since. Some of those were once Protestant. And the reversal took place. They succeeded. What did they claim? The church, Catholic Church, is the only, is the only one faithful to Scripture. Now, it's interesting. They did not ever define their own position. They only did anathemas against extreme things that Protestants were doing. But they did not define their own position. Therefore, they couldn't be pinned. You understand what I'm saying? So they're left dealing with the extreme. And in most cases, the Protestants could say not guilty, or at least Melanchthon's you, you followers, not guilty, not guilty. By putting a Pelagian free will, they were misrepresenting Melanchthon all the time because the Lutherans took that as Melanchthon's position. But it never was. Never was. Here, I, have I done the first one? Or the number two. 
Roman Catholic Church is the only official and sole interpreter of Scripture. Now, is that sole of Scripture? Well, it sounds to me much like the Roman Catholic Church, as it always was, imposing its view of truth on everyone instead of allowing them to go to the scriptures for themselves. And by the way, if there's not priesthood of believers, and this denies any priesthood of believers, if there's not priesthood of believers, there cannot be sola scriptura. If there's not sola scriptura, there cannot be sola gratia, sola fide, because there is no authority for it. Mm -hmm. Do you hear what I'm saying? No authority for it. You can't, you, if you believe it, it's on your own hook. It's your own uh, view, okay? Um, some Trent expressions appear like expressions of free will Protestants, but their real meaning can only be determined by examining the underlying presuppositions. The first three attack, uh, canons attack ultra-Pelagianism, even while defending. They're not defending Pelagianism yet. The defense will come later. But they attack ultra-Pelagianism and and. and, and and, of course, the Nicios said, oh, see there, see there, that you're Roman Catholic. That, no, 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 no. They were misrepresenting about Melanchthon's views. They were not representing it, but misrepresenting it. They were actually denying Roman Catholic extremism. That's what they denied. And hook and attaching it to Protestantism and charging that with Protestant, Protestantism. Brothers and sisters, if we had just started we could go through a few of those and, and you would see what I'm talking about. I will not leave you without some evidence of, you know, the canon. So first, canon one sounds like a, a good Protestant thing, doesn't it? If anyone says, and I'm not going to say Seth, but I, I, I wrote it here because I wanted it to be accurate as to exactly how they wrote it. And I fortunately left out some of the things so you wouldn't have to be bored with them. But if anyone says that man may be justified by God by his own works, listen carefully, sounds like a Protestant, without the grace of God through Jesus, let him be anathema. What's wrong with that? Well, it sounds good. But all it's doing is to deny ultra-Pelagianism. It is not denying Pelagianism. This seems to take justification by works charges right out of the Protestant mouths. But it only attacks Pelagian extreme. Well, I guess I just said that, didn't I? Justification without grace, which was anathema to free will. Well, brothers and sisters, number two, if any man says that the grace of God through Jesus is given only that men may more easily live justly and merit eternal life, as if free will without grace he were able to do both, though with difficulty let him be anathema. It only touches the extreme Pelagianism, which I said a while ago, extreme Pelagianism says you don't really have to have God's grace to obey. You can do it, it's hard, it's difficult. If you have God's grace, it makes it easier, but you don't have to have it. Now, this is a, uh, an extreme position. Didn't touch. By the way, there were a few of Melanchthon's followers that this would apply to, but they tarred the hole with the brush of a few extremists. There will be extremists in every group. It avoids the Trent's own Galatian, uh, 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 Galatian theology. By the way, Galatian theology is Pelagian theology. And I, I, I put Galatian because they use Galatians falsely, not truly. Justification by faith plus works. Uh, number three, if anyone says that without prevenient inspiration of the Holy Ghost, watch this carefully, without prevenient inspiration of the Holy Ghost, man can hope love or be penitent as he ought so that the grace of justification may be bestowed upon him. Let him be anathema. This makes sanctification 
a doctrine that must precede justification as though we must be purified before we're justified. Now, I, I won't have time to discuss that further, but this is the kind of, 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 of presentation. Now, to prove that Adventists are Pelagian, some time ago, somebody took the very doctrines of Trent, a few of them, and gave them to an Adventist group of people, a conservative group, a, a ultra-conservative, and when they presented them, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Does that mean Adventists are, uh, theology is Trent? Not even extreme Adventism touches Trent. The amens were an expression of confusion. They did not know what was meant by these words. If they had known, they would have thrown their hands up. No, not at all. Brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventists have not been, are not, and in no way to be identified with Trent. Canon number four. If anyone says, now I'm going through these, aren't I? Well, maybe you can do it quickly. If anyone says that man's free will moved by God, no wise cooperates preparing itself for obtaining the grace of justification that it cannot refuse its consent, but that as something inanimate it is merely passive. Let him be anathema. Do you see the switch from anti-extreme Pelagianism to anti-extreme Augustinianism? We've switched around now. The big attack is against Augustinian, extreme, uh, 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 extreme Augustinianism. And now we're going to be plowing that way consistently more and more but there's still a Pelagian element. Roman Catholicism is Pelagianism and Augustinianism, two opposite views that have been welded together so that Satan can draw people of all persuasions into one communion that is united by the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church under the papacy, under the Pope. This is Satan's great strategy. He gathers the whole world together in, in one big basket. And it doesn't matter that they're opposite to each other. Canon 5, if anyone says that since Adam sinned, the free will of man is lost or, and extinguished, or that it is a thing that with only a name, without a reality, introduced into the church by Satan, let him be anathema. Now, that's attacking uh, ultra-Calvinism. But it does not touch Melanchthon free will. It has nothing to do with it. Melanchthon would not ever word anything of that kind. But it gives a handle to Nicios to, to smash and oppose. And I think it's next lecture where we're dealing with that. This is a clever strike against the Calvinists and Nicios that made Philips, Philippus vulnerable to the charge that they reflect the Council of Trent. Canon 6, if anyone says that it is not in man's power to make his ways evil, it's dealing with, again with extreme Augustinianism. If anyone says it is not in the power to make his ways evil, that the works that are evil, God works as well as those that are good, not permissively only, but properly as Judas as well as Paul. In other words, Judas couldn't do anything else because God predetermined his role. Let him be anathema. Well, again, it doesn't touch either side, really, but it takes the extremes of Roman Catholicism itself and brands it, by, by default, brands it as Protestant. 
So it's a, I say it's a valid charge. Calvinists and Nicios do make God responsible for evil deeds as well as righteous. Judas and Paul are equally prisoners in that theory of unalterable decrees. Well, the first three destroy Protest the Protestant confidence in free will by associating it with Pelagianism. And here we get it back to Tulip. Did I ever talk to you? Uh, it, yeah, to begin with. Tell me again. Total. All right, thank you. <laughs> Total depravity and unlimited grace and uh, limited atonement. Ah, oh. notice that. Have unlimited grace, but limited atonement. And then irresistible grace. I, irresistible grace. And P, the, the perseverance of the elect, guaranteed. What you need to know is whether you're elect or not. If you're elect, you can just forget about everything because you can't be lost. But if you're not elect, you can't be saved. Brothers and sisters, this tulip is the very, I'm, this, is, this is Lutheran language, ultra-Lutheran language. This is the language of most evangelicals today. It is once saved, always saved. You understand what I'm saying? And most of those letters are false. There is no such thing as limited atonement. When Christ died, he died for everyone, not just for elect. And there is no such thing as absolutely guaranteed. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost the, the P. Perseverance. There is no such thing. There's a perseverance by continual choice to receive the reproof of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit shows us where our departure from the principles of Christ, then we rejoice that he has spoken to us and we immediately claim it and thank God for it. And for everyone who chooses to do such, there is absolute certainty because Christ is our atonement. If we have him, we have atonement. But we don't have it because we had him, but because we have him. Present tense. Somebody asked me before the meeting, are we saved or are we going to be saved? And uh, the answer actually is yes if we understand both statements. We are in a saved position as long as we're in Christ. But it's our choice. You see, we're, the probationary period is given. Nobody's judged until the final end. And even if I'm a drunk and, 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 and in a terrible state, God does not judge me while I still have life. The judgment comes at the end of the world. But if I'm out of Christ, I'm certainly not saved. And if I'm in a gr drunken stupor, then I'm out of Christ. You understand what I'm saying? But if I choose to look to Christ, he will, he will save me from drunkenness and from whatever else. He will bring me into himself and I will there be saved. Always saved? No. Saved in Christ. Those that are in Christ Jesus. He that has the Son has what? Life. life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. As long as I have the Son by faith, I have life. And if I do not have him, no matter what my past is, no matter how wonderful my experience has been, if I do not have him, I do not have life because life is in the Son. And we have life in relation to him. Well, that's the tulip thing. Uh, merit all the way through. And by the way, I'm not, going, I'm not going to go through these because I can't because I'll get stuck in them. But one after another emphasize the necessity of believing in human merit. And that means that I merit salvation. It is not that I receive Christ's merits. 
but that I also merit. I think it would be wise at this time for me to just kind of sail down to the very end. And uh, I see my brother nodding his head, yes. <laughs> he knows what's best. Here is number 30. Uh, if anyone says that after the grace of justification has been received, that guilt is remitted, and the debt of eternal punishment is blotted out, so that there remains no, not any debt of temporal punishment to be discharged in this, either in this world or in the next in purgatory. Before the entrance into the kingdom of heaven, let him be anathema. Well, does that sound Protestant? No. You ever hear any Adventists talk that way? No. What this is saying is that the church has control over a person even after he dies. And that if you are forgiven, you still have to pay back. And the church decides how much you pay and how. how. Penance. And even after you're dead, you still have a debt that has to be paid. And if your loved ones are loving enough, they'll pay for it for you. And if not, well, you're going to have to suffer in purgatory and you have to pay the temporal debt for that which you were forgiven of. Oh, brothers and sisters, you know that's nothing. If anyone says that, he is, that the justified sins when he performs good works with a view, notice, he performs good works with a view to an eternal recompense, let him be anathema. What this is saying is that no one should question penance. Because penance is based on the assumption that I'm going to do these things and I will receive certain merits from them. And if you deny that, then you need to be anathema. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? This is actually a defense, direct defense, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church to, 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 uh, to the doctrine of purgatory and, and uh, to the various as well as hell and so forth. Well, that's 31. Here's 32. If anyone says that the good works are not also the good merits of him that is justified, now notice, if the good works are not also the good merits of him that is justified, or that the said justified does not merit increased grace and eternal life, and the attainment of that and that and the actual attainment of that eternal life, which you see, there are two different things in Roman Catholicism. You might have merited it, but you can't attain it until the Roman Church says you've finished your temporal debt. You see the difference in that. If this is, and also an increase in glory. Oh, what's the Minneapolis message? To humble in the death the glory of man. But if that's the case, then let it be anathema. Brothers and sisters, the Roman Catholic Church could not exist except for the doctrine of merit and the doctrine of the Eucharist. The Eucharist in which the Roman Catholic Church produces Christ. And it is the requirement to participate in that at a certain regular basis in order for you to be forgiven and so forth. If it were not for the priesthood confessional and the Eucharist and penance, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy would dissolve. The papal power is based upon that. This is the last one, Canon 33. How does it finish? If anyone says that by the Catholic doctrine touching justification, by this holy synod set forth in this present decree, that is the 33 points, if anyone says the glory of God or the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ are in any way derogated from, that is belittled, 
and not rather that the truth of our faith and the glory of God and Jesus Christ are rendered more illustrious, let him be anathema. If you do not believe that all of these decrees are true and that following them will enhance your merit, etc., and let him be anathema. This is the Council of Trent. This, these are a few of the doctrines of Trent. Brothers and sisters, I want to conclude by an appeal. I don't, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I mean, this, is, this is important. There's a consistent thread from all 33 decrees, and they're called decrees. And they're decrees of a church that cannot err and a church that has the salvation, claims the salvation of all the people. You can not only be saved through the church because the church has the merits of Christ to dispense to you and you can't get them otherwise. Both Pelagian and Augustinian extremes are castigated, cut away, in a way to defend the principles of both Pelagius and Augustine. The crucial bond is human merit and papal authority based on and empowered by Augustinian doctrines of original sin, the Eucharist, the penance, immortality, and eternal hell, infant baptism, and purgatory. Pelagian merit thus enforces Augustinian heresy. Now, this is the last one I remember. Conservative Adventism. Uh, is it true? Yeah, I have one more. <laughs> Conservative Adventism does lack the Minneapolis insight, which leaves us in a, in a legalistic lean. We're not legalists by theology, but we don't have a theology that will remove Legalism. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we, we have not, we've been too bound by the, uh, uh, you know, by justification, past sins, sanctification, the present, leaving the future under, uh, 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 in, in doubt. Because we never know. Even if we are sure that we're forgiven, we never know if we're accepted in the present. That's not biblical truth. No, the, no Adventist believes in that. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to pass this by. I wanted to read this last one. Our experience becomes legalistic unless we claim Christ's righteousness by faith and live by faith in him. And that proves that that's the last one. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you tonight, and I, I'm sorry, we, you know, the question and answer to period took a whole session, and by your grace of remaining here, I've had the privilege of going through this, and I hope it's been worthwhile. It's a very technical session that we've just had, and I want to close it by appealing to you to believe that God gave us a message that corrects legalism, that corrects antinomianism, and that focuses our minds on the one in whom we are saved. And I would like to say, I hope every one of you leave this, this auditorium tonight claiming Christ's righteousness, and you can do it now. You don't have to wait until you've gotten your house in order. You'll never get your house in order if you wait for that. I tried eight years long. And by the way, I've had a lot of things to learn since then, but I use that as the basics. That's where I got the first real understanding uh, of, of justification. I had to find more about sanctification. I'm still learning. I'm still having to learn because I've never learned anything adequately. I keep forgetting. And uh, you, you know what I'm saying? I, no, I never forget it. But, but, but somehow it's not present with me adequately. And, and, and I act in, in ways that are not in harmony with my understanding because I can't always focus adequately all the time, but I don't have to to be saved. But I do have to learn that constancy in order to glorify God and be a part of that 
latter rain which will only fall upon those who can be trusted never again to look to self. And that's what's really involved in the sealing. Shall we uh, stand? Father in heaven, you know our weaknesses. You know that even though we have had a glimpse of the importance of Christ, our righteousness today, that our own natures will betray us and we will have to come oftentimes to the feet of Jesus and plead for his grace mm. to remain faithful. Help us to remember that our faithfulness is not dependent upon ourselves, but upon looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Mm. In the name of Jesus, amen.